The Postal Service has never been funded by taxpayer money. I mean, come on, why would it, guys? The Postal Service provides a service to the public. It, it's not like it's going out there starting wars in countries we have no business being in. Come on. <laughs> Look, when the Postal Service starts killing black and brown people on purpose, then we can start using taxes to fund it. <laughs> <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, exactly. Look, this is America, damn it. Land of freedom and not understanding the Second Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Fork Full of Noodles. I'm your host, Krish Mohan. Hey, you are probably going to hear some background laughter in this episode, and that is from real people that are in the virtual audience for this show. Uh, every single Friday, almost every single Friday, uh, I do these shows called the Citizen Revolution Shows, which eventually become episodes of Fork Full of Noodles. Uh, so if you want to be a part of this show, you can do so by grabbing tickets right off of my website for the next one. They happen on Fridays at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, and tickets are available on my website at krishmohanhaha.com. That's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you can uh, become a sustaining member. You can make a one-time donation. Uh, you can download my albums. You can check out past videos. It's the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. And uh, by becoming a sustaining member, a big thing that you do is by is help shows like this, help help all of the, the shows that I do, uh, Forkful of Noodles, Taboo Table Talk, The Dispatches, The Road Reflections, everything you see on this channel. And you get free tickets to be a part of the live virtual audience uh, for the Citizen Revolution show. Uh, sustaining members never have to pay for a ticket. They have access to every single show. Uh, so once again, go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. Now on to the episode. The United States Postal Service, right? Before everybody yawns and goes to bed at the thought of a show surrounding mail, uh, <laughs> I, I will promise you that this show will be as interesting as a show written about the Federal Reserve. Oh, oh I can hardly wait. <laughs> okay, that's a bad that's a bad example, but it's but it's still like a, a more interesting topic than what people think it's going to be. <laughs> but this summer, the entire country saw the Postal Service get gutted, and if you only pay attention to any of the news surrounding the post office and missed everything in the last one hundred years you would think that Trump was the only person trying to attack them, right? Just like most people thought that Trump invented racism or <laughs> wanting to sleep with a porn star or overusing the word terrific, right? Or boasting about how great their dick works at 70. <laughs> Look, America is a 300-something-year-old country that has been racist since its inception, always wanted to fuck porn stars, but kind of had to settle, and had been, has been bragging about its dick since it learned the word military. <laughs> <laughs> Trump is a symptom of the American disease, which is narcissism mixed with erectile dysfunction. That's the American <laughs> disease. And besides, let's be honest, if Trump had invented militarism or racism or xenophobia or authoritarianism, they would have all gone bankrupt by 1992. <laughs> Which, not that bad, right? You kind of wish he had invented those things. <laughs> so they, we wouldn't have to deal with them anymore. And look, I'll be honest myself, I particularly haven't been pay paying attention to what's been happening with the Postal Service either, right? No one cared how the mail was sorted and delivered. You know, people don't really care how the sausage is made, so they definitely didn't care 
about how it was mailed to you or why people are mailing sausages. It's a weird thing to mail. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't be mailing meats. But, but no one really started paying attention to the post office until this pandemic started and Trump appointed a new postmaster general, Louis DeJoy, who wanted to completely destroy the service, right? DeJoy was set to cut pay decrease services at the post office, uh, the, the services that the post office offers, wanted to take away mailboxes, and finally prove that the Republican Party is just the Legion of Doom wearing suits. <laughs> and, and come on, are we really surprised that someone named DeJoy is trying to destroy the service that sends, you know, presents and letters from our grandmas? You know, guys, his name literally translates to removing joy. <laughs> That's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> you know, look, at the beginning of this pandemic, uh, the previous Postmaster General, Megan Brennan, requested $75 billion in stimulus, right? $25 billion for immediate use to pay employees, keep them safe and the services active, and the rest to use over time to keep the post offices running. The president of the American Postal Union said this, was, this amount was absolutely necessary since about 12,000 postal employees have gotten sick due to COVID-19, and 64 others have died. But the Democratic-controlled House approved a $10 billion stimulus for the United States Postal mm -hmm. Service, once again claiming that the Republicans would block it if it was any higher. You know what's funny is that you never hear the Republicans say anything like this, right? You never hear Republicans come out and be like, boy, you know, we'd like to control women's bodies, but, you know, the Democrats might say something mean about it. <laughs> you, just, you just never hear them. Like, there is no reason that the Democrats shouldn't have fought harder to expand funding for the Postal Service. Right? I mean, let's get serious, guys. This is the Postal Service. It's not the American working class. They could have fought a little harder. Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> now, the reason why the Postal Service is in bad financial shape is due to a 2006 Bush administration bill that was written by two Republicans and two Democrats called the Postal Accountability Enhancement Act, or P -A -E -A. And this piece of legislation made the Postal Service pre-fund retirement for all of its current and future retirees for 75 years. And this included any employee that would eventually be hired. Literally no other department or corporation has any kind of plan like this. This is the most insane piece of legislation that's ever been written. <laughs> Right, yeah, and the government's calling for more accountability from the post office, but not the police. What? Well, that's like letting Gary Busey take care of your kids. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right? like, like, you know Gary's gonna do drugs, but you wind up putting cameras on the kids instead, right? Just in case they have some extra stuff. <laughs> You never know. Meanwhile, Busey's kidnapped the dog, eaten everything in your pantry, and somehow sold your refrigerator that came with the house. <laughs> <laughs> now, in 2006, most Congress people voted to approve the PAEA, including Bernie Sanders. Right? Only one Democrat and about 20 Republicans voted against this pre-funding plan. This consistently put the Postal Service in debt over $5 billion every year since 2006 in order to meet this requirement. And this was after the Postal Service was netting a profit of $9.3 billion every year between 2003 and 2006. Now, when people asked where this pre-funding money was going to come from, Congress just responded, I don't know, bootstraps. <laughs> Sounds like something we can do. 
Yeah, socialism only works for capitalism when it's trying to dismantle the necessities, doesn't it? Look, if Congress is going to approve the Postal Service to pre-fund universal retirement, then I think it's only fair that Dick Cheney and the entire Bush dynasty should pre-fund health care for everyone that is alive, has died, will be dead, and born for the next 75 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, George Bush can use the money he gets from his uh His painting. finger paints? <laughs> <laughs> he's releasing a book of immigrants that he's painted that has meant, meant things in his life. God, it's are they all, out next is, it, year. is it all immigrants from Sweden? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Could be. <laughs> that, that, that's where they're all from. He's gotten better at painting. Look, I think, I think there's, there, there's, he's gotten better at painting. <laughs> Is he better at painting than he is at war crimes? We'll never know. Uh, <laughs> because no one is going to try him for that. <laughs> it's either George Bush's paintings that are going to uh, pay for the pre-funded health care initiative or more bootstraps. <laughs> Those are our options. <laughs> In June of 2020, uh, Trump appointed Louis DeJoy as the Postmaster General. Now he is one uh, the first Postmaster General in decades with no prior experience in the Postal Service. Right? This is basically like saying Tom Hanks should run the Postal Service because he played a FedEx employee in the film Castaway. <laughs> <laughs> in completely unrelated news, though, I, I I just found out this morning. I don't know if you guys saw this or not, uh, but Carrot Top has now been appointed as the Secretary of Defense. <laughs> <laughs> because why not? <laughs> now, uh, DeJoy has said that the postal workers should, quote, adopt a different mindset. Yes, and, and he's absolutely right, right? They should adopt a different mindset, a mindset where, you know, you're not going to be able to, like, eat or, like, be alive. You know, a, a mindset where you're not as much postal workers but more of a postal slave, you know? You're, you're Django unmailed, if you will. Oh. oh, come on. That's a pretty good one. I was pretty excited about that when I thought of this this afternoon. <laughs> That's not that bad. <laughs> now, DeJoy is the former vice president of a multinational supply chain logistics and shipping corporation called XPO Logistics. Not only should this be a major red flag that he was the vice president of a shipping company and now is in charge of the Postal Service, but also his company's name was completely unimaginative, right? XPO Logistics, who gives a shit? Now you could have named it Land, Air, and Sea Corporation or Last Corp. That is a great ring to it. <laughs> <laughs> I might have missed my call in marketing. <laughs> <I might have. laughs> but the reddest of all red flags should be the fact that he graduated from Stetson University in Central Florida. Folks, do we really want a Floridian to be in charge of a major mail service? <laughs> <laughs> I say nay. <laughs> nay, I say. Now, he's also the, uh, the president of LTJ Global, which is a corporation interested in real estate, private equity, consulting, and project management. By the way, project management is the communications degree of job titles. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually what you tell people at parties when you don't want to talk to them anymore, right? Like, what do you do? Oh, I'm in project management. Oh, okay. <laughs> 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 no one can really answer that question. <laughs> what kind of projects do you manage? <laughs> now, the major controversy surrounding DeJoy is the fact that he is a major donor to the Republican Party, right? Helping George W. get reelected, and he contributed over $27,000 to Jeb Bush in 2016, right? He didn't even pick a winner in 2016, you guys. 
but with his ties to the Bush brothers and a private logistics and delivery co uh, company, it's very clear that this is a corporate coup to try to privatize the United States Postal Service. Now, a major reason to defund the Postal Service, according to Donald Trump, is mail-in voting, which is primarily handled by the Postal Service. No, no other shipping or logistics company can handle something like this. And Trump claims that if people vote via mail, there is a higher risk of fraud. And when asked for specifics, he just gave everybody the finger <laughs> as he screamed fake news and a Secret Service member threw a smoke bomb and whisked him away to a bunker where no mailman can ever find him. <laughs> Look, let's let's be honest. We're dealing with the American election system, right? So no matter what way you vote, it's not going to be a perfect system. And mail-in voting is no different. It's not without its problems, right? Like, there's a lot of questions you need to answer. Like, do we need extra stamps if we're voting for a socialist? <laughs> <laughs> We don't know. No one's been able to answer that question for me. And I have been calling a lot. <laughs> but it's far more secure than, I don't know, say gerrymandering states with districts that literally looked like a blurred out penis. <laughs> it's far more secure than interstate cross check, which is a system that removes voters of the same last name in different states, and it's far safer than black box voting machines with proprietary coding. Not just that, but going to the polls during a voracious pandemic is wildly irresponsible, right? Most poll workers are elderly folks. And sure, you could say that this should encourage more younger folks to get involved in poll work, right? Get involved in the election. And my retort to that would be to have fucking younger candidates that the youth can actually be excited about instead of two <laughs> racist gas bags. Well said. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, bolstering the Postal Service is absolutely necessary, and the stimulus request is reasonable since the use of mail is pertinent for people to order food, pay their bills, and get medication. Right, 80% 80 per, 80 of prescription medications from the VA is delivered by the Postal Service. Look, if we could email each other drugs, <laughs> go with me on this. Yeah. I feel like Big Pharma would have partnered with Gmail years ago. Right? <laughs> like, like instead of Nigerian princes trying to hack our emails, it would have just been all of our cousin Ricky's. <laughs> just trying to score some extra digital Valium. <laughs> Wouldn't be that bad. And sidebar, sidebar, yes, Indian people can have cousins named Ricky too, okay? <laughs> If the most notable Indian American politicians are named Bobby Jindal and Nikki Haley, I'm sure this fictional drug addicted cousin I made up can go by Ricky. <laughs> All right. Got me there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he's got a backstory. Okay. He was picked on in high school and he needed a white sounding name to get reelected in South Carolina. So. <laughs> feel like it makes sense. I feel like it checks out. Yeah. <laughs> now, the Postal Service today is just as important as it was during its inception, right? When the nation was expanding westward, California was basically an island on its own. And thanks to the Postal Service, the East and the West were able to communicate with each other, just like Chris Rock and Jackie Chan in the hit film Rush Hour and Rush Hour 2. <laughs> Clearly a metaphor for the Postal Service. <laughs> now, first thing that new towns would do would be to establish a post office. The idea was to create equality between small towns and big cities so that they would have the same 
amenities, right? No one's getting left behind here. Now, newspapers were shipped for free by the Postal Service. In one week's time, someone in California could know what's going on in the city of Boston. I mean, in the 17 and 1800s, that was basically like having 4G on your phone, right? <laughs> <laughs> so that was a pretty big deal back then and all this stuff the newspaper was shipped for free right and in the 19 month gap to expand the telegraph lines the pony express would deliver mail across the country in a matter of 10 days and it was so important to deliver the mail that america developed postal roads which were pretty much like early highways they were the they were they were the before times highways is what they were so without the Postal Service, Frontiers people would have been isolated, remained ignorant to the nation's concerns, and we wouldn't have highways, right? The Postal Service determined major modern conveniences, just like porn determines the pace of technology today. <laughs> <laughs> so if you really think about it, the Postal Service is like the porn of America. And that's why I'm doing this show with no pants on <laughs> in honor of the postal service you guys in honor of the postal service now throughout august uh there were activists that organized protests outside DeJoy's north carolina and washington dc mansions look you can't represent the working class if you have more than one mansion <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's, that would basically be like Tom Hanks representing the NAACP. It's just stupid. <laughs> now, at this point, uh, when, when we're doing the show, at this point, DeJoy said that he won't be putting any of these heavier restrictions on the service till the election is done. And the Democrats have come back from vacation to fund the Postal Service the $25 billion they asked for back in March. And look, I'm not against this, right? I'm all for this. I'm all for funding the United States Postal Service. We need this. But let's be honest, this kind of feels like posturing because we have elections coming up in terms of Democrats, right? I mean, if they were truly, truly for keeping this service active, they would have fought to get them the $25 billion at the least back in March, right? And this is another example of how activism protests and amplification can get legislation to swing in the right direction. The United States Postal Service is an American institution that made this country what it is. And any attempts to destroy, defund, or detract from this service should be seen as un-American. Louis DeJoy is a disgrace to all previous Postmaster Generals, including Ben Franklin, who was America's first Postmaster General. DeJoy is definitely not as funny or as sexy as Ben Franklin. <laughs> let's, be, let's be honest. Ben Franklin sent the first dick pics across the country. Let's be honest. That's what he did. <laughs> but we should be paying attention to what is going on with the Postal, postal Service, right? And how it continues to benefit our lives despite all of the manufactured challenges it faces. The Postal Service is a part of making America great by connecting communities, ensuring that we are an informed populace, and making sure that we are all taken care of. The Postal Service has been for the public good, and because of that, it's been the target of private interest since the early 20th century. And to really understand why the United States Postal Service is currently in $55 billion worth of debt, we have to go all the way back to 1907. Right, at the top of the century, major bankers like J.P. Morgan and John D. Rockefeller and all everyone in that circle were pushing to centralize America's banking industry so they have more control over the nation's money. So they created a rumor that a prominent bank in New York was failing, which created a panic and an eventual crash. And this was known as the Great Crash of 1907. Now, 
at, after that happened, the United States Postal Savings Bank was put into place in 1910 to prevent average citizens from losing everything when the financial system failed. And holy shit, did it fail a lot. Like, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, it fails like its job is to fail. You know, like, <laughs> 1907, 1914, 1929, in the 1970s, 2000, 2002, 2008, 2020. Also, in 2021, it'll fail. In 2020, you guys get the point. You guys see where I'm going with this. <laughs> Now, the Postal Savings Bank would be a public bank that would not only help the average working class, but it would also help fund the Postal Service in and of itself. The Postal Service has never been funded by taxpayer money. I mean, come on, why would it, guys? The Postal Service provides a service to the public. It, it's not like it's going out there starting wars in countries we have no business being in. Come on. <laughs> Look, when the Postal Service starts killing black and brown people on purpose, then we can start using taxes to fund it. <laughs> I see what you did there. Yeah, exactly. Look, this is America, damn it. Land of freedom and not understanding the Second Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if you wanted logic and understanding, then you can go to Canada, people. Okay, well, good luck getting your mail up there. Now, the Postal Bank would have been one of the largest public banks in the nation, right? And public banks are incredibly helpful since they save the unbanked and the underbanked. 28% of Americans either don't have a bank or access to a bank. And these folks depend on payroll cards that they can use for food or gas, which is similar to scripts, which is currency that the mining corporations use in their towns in the early 1900s, it's basically fake money to control the populace. 10% of Americans' income goes into paying fees, which includes $50 a month in ATM fees. A public postal bank would alleviate a lot of these issues. But in 1910, the largest wealthy bankers tried to centralize the banking industry where looking to pass the Federal Reserve Act and called the Postal Bank a menace. And after they caused the crash in 1929 and took America off of the gold standard for, for the currency, the Federal Reserve really needed America to, to, to trust centralized banks again, especially over the postal banks. So FDR enacted the FDIC insurance started putting caps on the Postal Bank and forced them to increase their interest rate. FDR basically bullied the Postal Bank by saying, stop indebting yourself, stop indebting yourself, stop indebting yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Just by the way, is anyone surprised when a majority of America's problem comes from an overpowered banking industry? <laughs> Right, they've, they've kind of become like the obvious villains in every story, haven't they? They're, they're kind of like the team rocket of villainy. <laughs> <laughs> like really bad at it. <laughs> they're, yeah, yeah. It's just like, oh, are we, are we all fucked as a nation? Bob, well, okay, there it is. The banking system's here. You know, they have like a theme <laughs> song and shit. For some reason, they have a talking cat. How do they get a talking cat? They probably paid for it. Yeah. <laughs> But look, I, I understand the idea of having a bank within the post office sounds weird, right? But the Postal Bank would be very similar to how something like AAA offers roadside assistance, car insurance, tourism help, medical insurance, elderly support, driver's license renewals, cake baking classes, right? Look, if Target and Apple can offer up their own credit card and financial services, then why can't the Postal Service offer a Postal Bank with better interest rate and customer care. In 2014, the Postmaster General actually made an argument for, for the need for a postal bank, but it fell on deaf ears, right? At that time, Obama was more concerned with the White House Correspondence Center, and the Republicans were more concerned over his tan suit. <laughs> a postal bank would provide all the service that most banks provide, 
at a better interest rate and would provide benefits a lot easier and quicker by partnering with various other government agencies. They would also provide retail lending to help small business America grow. Could you imagine the state of small businesses during a pandemic if a public postal bank could approve and grant low interest loans with greater forgiveness and get them that money faster? Holy oh, shit. It'd almost be like we were a logical country that was run on compassion, critical thinking, real empathy, and understanding. It would almost be like if we were Canada. <laughs> <laughs> America's hat. We're so, we're so close. <laughs> now, after FDR crippled the Postal Bank, much like polio had, you know, crippled him. <laughs> Oh my god. Dark joke, I know, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Some of the jokes I write I'm not very proud of. They come from a very, very dark place, deep in my heart, uh, filled with a lot of rage. Anyway, <laughs> after FDR crippled the Postal Bank, uh, Eisenhower took the next step and basically said, no government organization should be in direct competition with private enterprises and then abolishes the Postal Bank. I mean, this is why we can't have nice things, right? Like, like literally, this is the reason why we can't have nice things. This is the notion that private enterprise needs to grow infinitely instead of steadily. And it's basically the reason why America doesn't have things like universal health care or education, right? It has to be controlled by corporate interests so the spirit of competition can be alive to kick us all in the teeth and then charge us extra for dental. <laughs> <laughs> Look, have you guys ever have you guys ever played Mario Kart with your friends? You uh -huh. know, like a late night with Mario. Yeah, like it's fun, right? Playing the video games. Is, yeah, it's fun. You you get to compete. There's people are throwing turtle shells and banana peels all over the place, and people slip, and everybody laughs, and it's a really good time. But but then it gets like a little bit too serious. And then five minutes later, your friend is torching your gas tank so you don't beat them to Wendy's. <laughs> <laughs> That's what capitalism and the spirit of competition is. <laughs> it's a torch gas tank and too much fast food. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. Now, there were commenters in the 60s, all the way back in the 60s, that were talking about how the Postal Service should be privatized. And there are private entities that do similar things to the Postal Service, right? Like FedEx and UPX, or UPS, not UPS. Uh, cool name, though. Uh, but, in fact, FedEx, though, can pretty much do everything that the Postal Service can because the United States Postal Service had to sign away first-class mail rights to them. Yeah. Now, there was a little bit of hope for the United States Postal Service under one Richard Milhouse Nixon. Hmm. I know, I know, but wait for it. <laughs> Nixon was so terrible that the postal workers went on strike asking for better pay, better hours, and better work conditions. In 1970, the postal workers' average salary was roughly $2,200 a year, which translated to today is about $15,000 a year. And that's just shy of minimum wage, right? It's like $721 an hour, something along the lines. Now, fortunately, today the uh, a postal worker is making an average of $15 to $20 an hour, depending on the state that they work in. Plus, the job of a mailman is incredibly grueling, right? You, you guys, like, I watch mailmans come up and down. There's no way I'd be able to do that job, right? Try carrying <laughs> sacks of mail up and down the hills of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, or San Francisco, you know, especially for less than minimum wage, and then tell me where your frame of mind is, right? Mm -hmm. and because of how tough this job is, the turnover rate for the Postal Service in 1970 was 23%. Now, the Postal Service is the second largest employer of American citizens behind Walmart, you know, except people at the Postal Service are, like, way less dead on the inside. So, <laughs> big difference there. 
they're, they're also the largest employer of African Americans. Now, when the strike happened, when the great postal strike of 1970 happened, it was met with brevity and calm by Richard Nixon. I have just now directed the activation of the men of the various military organizations to begin in New York City the re restoration of essential mail services. New York City is where the current illegal stoppages began. It is where the mail has been halted the longest, and it is where the resultant problems have become most acute. If the Postmaster General deems it necessary to act in other affected major cities, I will not hesitate to act. These replacements are being sent in as a supplemental workforce to maintain essential services. Yes, of course, because clearly you need men with guns to handle the mail, okay? <laughs> Guys, you never know when a letter from your booby could explode, right? <laughs> with, you know, like love and fucking hard candies. It's dangerous shit. <laughs> Project, if it's a Werther's, that's going everywhere. <laughs> Right? I mean, guys, <laughs> let's be honest. Why would you pay postal workers better when you can just have armed gunmen attack your mailboxes? <laughs> and then they make sure that you pay your electric bill on time at gunpoint. That just sounds better because it's just, it's more fun. Now, the unions weren't behind the strike, but the rank and file went on strike anyway, right? They walked off and called sick, engaging in one of the largest wildcat strikes of the century. 150,000 letter carriers, in addition to 200,000 other employees, just walked off the job in March of 1970. And Nixon was so hurt by 350,000 postal workers striking that he went on national television asking for some understanding essential services must be maintained and as president i shall meet my constitutional responsibility to see that those services are maintained and i'm asking for the understanding and support of every american in this decision that i have made in behalf of our country Touching, isn't it? Very touching. And look, people were moved by by this. It's a, he's he's very good. He's very good at eliciting some kind of emotion from people. Uh, and and the postal workers were moved by this as well. So they did respond with a message of empathy. And now he can give himself a 100% raise. Congress can give himself a 41% raise, but we can't have nothing. You understand? People that change these light bulbs can get more money than we do. They bring home more money each month than we do. So I can't see why we shouldn't get our money. I think what in essence he said was, you go back to work or else you may jeopardize your job when I send in the troops to replace you. He said nothing about the possibility that he might not veto a pay increase. That is the one thing I wanted to hear. I think that's what most of us wanted to hear. Promises, promises, promises. Nothing's happening. Well, I think, uh, I don't think the people will go back to work until some kind of uh, negotiations or reach some kind of agreement because they're sick of this. The second to last person was my favorite. I liked her a lot. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I like what she promises, promises, promises. I'm like, yeah, that's how I feel, lady. You nailed it. Way to go. You're like my spirit animal. <laughs> <laughs> So why was Nixon fighting so desperately to get the mail out there, right? Because this was during the Vietnam War, which meant no draft notices, because all the draft notices were sent out by mail. No draft notices means no soldiers, means no wars, 
and that means no erections for Nixon. <laughs> <laughs> and if there are no erections for Nixon, Nixon, then how were him and Henry Kissinger supposed to show off their special no pants hug at the White House briefings? <laughs> This was the time before Viagra, and I am not sorry that I put that image in your head. <laughs> because I'm living with it too, you guys. <laughs> Everybody will share my pain. Anyway. <laughs> now, <laughs> the strike ended with Nixon giving collective bargaining rights to the Postal Service, but denied them the right to strike. This happened a lot in the later half of the, uh, the 20th century, right? They would offer... Uh, workers the the right to bar co collectively bargain but not give them the right to strike. They were trying to make strikes illegal. But they did add a compulsory arbitration which was required if a settlement through collective bargaining was not achieved. Essentially they began running the Postal Service like it was a corporation instead of a public service, which it is. right? And this isn't particularly a major win for the po Postal Service, but it's not a total loss either, right? Which is weird because I feel like Richard Nixon gave them like a solid neutral. That's basically what he did. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in 2006, the Postal Accountability and Enhancement Act is responsible for the Postal Service being in debt. Following uh, un a, a, under Obama, uh, following the, the passing of the bill under Obama, sorting and trucking were subcontracted and 65,000 postal workers lost their job. And this is triple whammy from the fact that this was at the height of email, which is now slowly being destroyed by Facebook Messenger and Twitter DMs. <laughs> and look, if you think email isn't in trouble, think about how often you've heard somebody say, slide into my inbox. <laughs> The answer is never, you guys. Nobody has ever fucking said that out loud. <laughs> no one even, no one gives out emails when they want to like. I don't have your email address, Chris. How could I slide into there? <laughs> I've, been, I've never tried to court somebody and been like, let me give you my email address. It's coolguy73. This is an old email address, right? Like no one ever fucking does that. <laughs> phone numbers or find me on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> but the internet did provide the postal service with its saving graces too, right? Most packages from online retailers were going through the post office. Now, this means that they needed new equipment to sort and deliver these packages, but it was another opportunity for private industry to strike again. Companies like Amazon have gotten into shipping and creating their own delivery service. And the Postal Service is getting hamstrung by how it can generate income. They can only sell stamps, passport services, and mail-related items. But companies like FedEx and UPS can sell mail-related items and retail goods. And look, if you're sending a package, do you really need a Kit Kat at that moment? This oh, rampant... <laughs> yeah, but look, this rampant need to snack every 10 minutes is also destroying the Postal Service. Maybe I do need a snack, damn it, I'm fat. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it. You can send that letter without a snack. I believe in you. I believe in don't you, you. Don't you body shame me. No fat shaming here. <laughs> <laughs> Do it for the Postal Service. I'm just trying to help. I'm just trying to be a patriot, damn it. <laughs> Look, Republicans have harshly said that the Postal Service doesn't deserve funding because it's an inefficient business. But how can it work effectively if all of the legislation written by Democrats and Republicans are meant to stifle the service? That's like taking your car to the mechanic to get an oil change, and then they shoot the engine and claim you're a bad driver. <laughs> <laughs> From the abolition of the public postal bank, stripping away its, their right to strike, and all the way to pre-funding retirement for 75 years, the Postal Service has been a target of private interests for, the, for over 100 years, right? When you have a public service that delivers our food, 
medicine, consumer goods, the bills we all tried to avoid by changing our addresses and moving to a different state and hoping that the Postal Service doesn't find us. Oh, but they find you. Oh, but they find you. <laughs> as, as well as our ballots and our information, the oligarchy will do everything in its power to bring that service to its knees and ensure that the working class remains in poverty and debt. The Postal Service can be saved if it's allowed to do what it's intended to do, right? Reversing all of the restrictive regulations would be a start. Giving the service the funding it needs and deserves would be another. Providing our mail carriers with the pay and benefits they deserve would also be huge. And look, it's about damn time that we started preserving American institutions like the United States Postal Service and dismantling unconstitutional ones like the centralized banking system that is pretty much the villain in every story. And that has been your fork full of noodles for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you enjoyed this episode, uh, please give it a like, please give it a share, uh, and uh, make sure that you are subscribed to my channel, whether you're watching this on Facebook, whether you're watching this on my website, whether you are watching this on the YouTubes or on Rockfin. Uh, if you're watching this on rockfin.com, awesome. You are part of the blockchain cryptocurrency ad-free site, which acts like Netflix for content creators, where for $10 a month, you get all of the premium content from all of the content creators that are on Rockfin. Content creators like Ron Placone, Graham Elwood, Jimmy Dore, uh, you got Kim Iverson, Nico House, The Convo Couch, and so, so many more, uh, including myself. So if you are tired of the, the mainstream uh, content creation sites like YouTube and Facebook, then head on over to Rockfin and follow me there. Become a subscriber uh, if you can. If not, that's totally cool, too. Uh, you can find all of my stuff available right on my website, uh, krishmohanhaha.com, which is the one-stop shop for all things Krish Mohan. Uh, past episodes of this show. You can get tickets for my live virtual stand-up comedy shows uh, and the actual live shows when touring starts back up again. Um, not only that, but you can also go to the donate page and become a sustaining member. Sustaining members get uh, additional stand-up comedy content and free tickets to the live virtual stand-up comedy shows. So if you want to do that and if you have the funds to do that, I hope that you do. Uh, and uh, uh, once again, the website is krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A dot com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next